Joe, we can't hear you. <laughs> what, what a start to the show. Welcome, everyone, to the special <laughs> questions and answers session. Uh, welcome to Creative Conversations. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, and all that jazz. Uh, I've made a total pig's ear of that. Uh, we're here with our international director, John Mackay. Uh, we're here with Craig Hawkins. We're here with Dr. Diane Eager and a, uh, a muted uh, Joe Hubbard who has left us. Oh, he's abandoned us already. There we go. Uh, but uh, how are we all doing? Well, well thanks. Yeah. Under in Australia. <laughs> those of us who are here. Yeah, what have you been doing this last week, Diane? Oh, sorry, you keep on disappearing. Uh, oh. <clears throat> what have I been doing this last week? Uh, well, I have been uh, doing the usual thing where we look at, uh, we keep a watching brief on what's coming out in the um, the news reports. Um, there was actually an interesting follow-up to a program that we did two weeks ago. Remember, we did archaeology, but we also looked at a question where um, uh, some uh, Church of England um, authorities, some bishops and, uh, and some British politicians were unable to define what is a woman. Well, in fact, those two things sort of collided with one another uh, in a report that we found where a, a, an archaeology group um, called the Black Trowel Collective are now claiming that uh, we shouldn't be uh, identifying skeletons or bones found in archaeological sites should not, not be defined as men or women uh, because they want to um, uh, impose their uh, non-binary uh, ideas on archaeological sites as well. Uh, so so really I thought that was rather, rather an interesting um, uh, collision between those two topics that we had two weeks ago that people can still watch on uh, uh, on the, our, our YouTube channel. Uh, <clears throat> but uh, I'll just see if I can find. I had it. I had it up on my screen actually. The um, well, Diane, Joseph's <coughs> back at the moment, so uh, our, our pre-planned, right. well-prepared order can re-emerge itself. Joe, are you on sound yet? I am on sound, hopefully. Oh, um, yes, I, there we I'm, go. Here we go. I don't know what happened. happened. I completely froze, but uh, we are at Creation Fest. Uh, which uh, we mentioned we've been going to be, be at for a little while. It's a big Christian music and teaching festival held down in the south of the UK every year. Uh, for the last couple of years, we've come and we've set ourselves up here with our uh, museum displays and everything. We've got a display in the uh, exhibition hall, and we get basically given full reign uh, of this outside area where we have everything set up and ready. Um, it is still light outside, and you can probably hear the, the music in the background if I keep quiet, which is why in between speaking I'm going to be turning my microphone off because it is a big music festival and the booming bass is rattling <laughs> the tent posts but hopefully you'll be able to hear me nice and clearly we've got some really exciting stuff to uh, announce to you today and give you some updates about and we'll have a little bit of a look around the tent setup that we have as well and uh, then we'll come back to Diane right at the and to start off the Q&A, which was our original plan before you disappeared. Craig, what about you? Oh, I've what just been really doing? been working this last week, but um, uh, in, in normal sort of work. But we had a real encouragement last night when we had a concert with uh, Peter Shirley, a, a well-known Christian uh, musician in, in Australia, at least, and, and internationally in some places. And there was a, a local woman there who uh, came along, one of the first events that uh, I've seen her at, um, who, who basically became a Christian largely as a result of the Creation Centre. And we didn't even know this. Uh, three months early she had visited uh, and then in the intervening period became a Christian and came back to the Creation Centre. I think she's been there three or four times now. Um, and told one of our volunteers there that uh, it had a huge part to play in her decision to come to faith, which was fantastic. Oh, that's great. That's great. <clears throat> yeah, really great. Mm. And uh, as for myself, I've been very busy. Um, Joe, uh, I, I've had a school this last week at Jurassic Ark, and I also remember fondly preaching at Pete Shirley's church. 
down there in Tassie and uh, have known him for a long time, particularly because I had four daughters who thought his music was absolutely wonderful. So uh, I, I grew up, uh, or they grew up, uh, knowing quite a bit about his lovely music. If you haven't heard of it, look up Peter Shirley. He still has stuff out there online as well as available, and you'll find uh, uh, some really great gospel music out there. Now, Joe, did you want to do any slides to start with here before I do some slides on my week at Jurassic Ark? No, I think uh, what we'll just uh, do is if you guys go ahead, I've got a, a big announcement to make, which we'll make in a little while, uh, once to, before we kind of dive into the Q&A side of things. But just to say, if you are down here in Cornwall uh, or around in Cornwall, do come along and see us. We have all of our display set up. It's still not too late if you want to come and help out and volunteer, by the way. Excuse me. Uh, we have all our display set up. We've got books and DVDs for sale. We've got fossils for sale, as well as marvellous. You can probably just see just to the side here some wonderful great big fossils, big mosasaur jaws, all sorts of uh, big exciting things to be able to go on display. So come along if you're around. Um, but also keep a watch out on our YouTube channel because we will be bringing some live videos from you here tomorrow. We've spent the last day basically just getting set up. We didn't get here until about 6 o'clock last night trying to get everything organized and sorted out. So um, the tomorrow we'll be bringing you some live videos uh, from around here, uh, both on our Facebook page and our YouTube page. So just keep a watch out for tomorrow and you carry ahead, guys. I'll catch you in a little bit for some uh, big announcement stuff. Okay. Don't get too lost, Joe, because you remember you've got last gen here trying to put his PowerPoints up. So oh, first yes, of all, indeed. I put my, uh, my little Windows button, correct? You and just have to go down, no, go, down, go down to your PowerPoint, <laughs> hover over yep. your PowerPoint, click on your full screen presentation, and you should be ready to scroll through. Okay. Is that yes, on we now? we can see it now. Yeah, you're all you're yeah, all good to go. That's good. That's mm. good. Ready to go. All right. So uh, we are getting our Jurassic Ark ready for our big annual. Uh, well, it hasn't been annual for the past three years because of COVID, but uh, getting ready to do our open day, which is basically come along and see everything uh, that we've been spending your money on. Uh, it's a public accountability as well as a great day. But just yesterday we had a wonderful time because we were actually uh, hang on. Why, why isn't it moving ahead, Joe? If you just click on your uh, presentation and then click right, we should be all right. Okay, let's try that. No, it's not right. It's not even left. Okay. Just make sure you go, go down to the bottom of your screen, hover yeah. over your PowerPoint presentation, your PowerPoint icon. Yeah. It should pop up hover two little windows. Button. Click on your full screen presentation. Okay, I'm sorry, but this is not going anywhere. Okay, you'll have to do that again. And sorry, audience okay. out there, it's incompetent. Just go in the down. Last just go down to go down to the bottom of your screen. Can you see a little PowerPoint yep. icon? No. Nope. All right. Oh, no. No, cannot do that. Okay. All right. So I'm back with the screen, and you guys down on the side, and nothing else is okay. happening. Okay. Fine. That's fine. Just go down to your PowerPoint icon. You see the PowerPoint icon down the bottom? Uh, the answer is no. Right. It's not much fun, okay. is it? Here, folks no. are watching. Press, press, John, press your Windows key. Yeah. Four little square, right? That should bring yep. up the bar down the bottom. Can you see the PowerPoint yep. icon, the little P? Right. Hover over that. Then yep. click on your full screen presentation. No, that's the. It's bringing up a wrong one, Joe. Oh uh, yeah. Okay. Well. Good. How about we skip me for the moment? We have a report from Diane until we can sort out this uh, this little mess here that John Mackay, creation guy, brilliant with live and dead fossils, absolutely incompetent when it comes to computer electronics. Diane, why don't you bring us where you were at and we'll try and fix this behind the scenes. <laughs> yes, yes, I, I was just saying that um, we had an interesting uh, collision, as it were, of two topics that we did two weeks ago where we looked at archaeology and we also um, dealt with a, an issue that came up when the Church of England was unable to put out uh, a, a definition of a woman and uh, <clears throat> we were reminded about uh, some British politicians who had equally have a problem with that. Now, we did answer that question and you can watch the uh, pro program on our YouTube channel but during the week, someone um, 
sent us in a, a report that uh, some gender activists um, from an organisation called the Black Trow Collective have now decided that we should not um, impose binary ideas, in other words, the idea that there are men and women on archaeological sites. <clears throat> and uh, they are an activist group that support uh, a number of uh, issues, including what they call trans liberation. And they have a, a manifesto, and in their manifesto they've written, and this is a quote uh, as reported in the uh, newspapers, um, it is clear from archaeological, historical and ethnographic accounts that human gender is highly variable and that human beings have historically been comfortably comfortable with a range of genders beyond modern masculine and feminine binaries. So um, <clears throat> they are promoting the idea that uh, gender is fluid and it was even fluid back in the times when... Uh, these uh, archaeological sites um, have been dated to. Uh, however, that has not gone down terribly well with the um, uh, archaeological uh, uh, the academics. And uh, the, uh, the Daily Mail uh, interviewed various uh, people for comments. And uh, one of them, uh, a, a professor named Jeremy Black from the University of Exeter said, uh, and this is their quote, um, it is an absurd proposition, that, that is, he thinks this is an absurd proposition that uh, archaeological sites should be considered gender fluid. Uh, I'll read out the rest of the quote. It's an absurd proposition as the difference between genders, just as the difference between religious, social and national groups are key motors in history. So uh, interesting... Um, clashes of ideology going on there uh, between the uh, mainstream academics and this uh, organization that's trying to impose gender fluid ideology even on bones that have been buried for thousands of years. Uh, so oh, do yeah. have a look at Good. our program on archaeology and on um, uh, on uh, the, the question what is a woman and also we have a uh, a we have a, um, a fact file report about that when the issue first came up with the British politicians quite a few months ago. But it's an issue that's in the news all the time now. We thought it was rather interesting that they were even trying to impose it on old bones in archaeological sites. Diane, it's interesting. I've been yeah. wandering around the country for the past two weeks and I can report yeah. on how the average person is reacting to this. You see, I was in right. one church and they had a set of toilets. One was marked Adam, the other was marked Eve. Now, it seemed that nobody at that church had a problem knowing which one they should go to. So the female humans, the gender uh, not free, the gender burdened humans to be female went to the Eve one, and the gender burdened males went to the Adam one. That was easy. Now, then I also came across a public toilet, and it basically had... Uh, male and female uh, but that was j just the normal way of distributing it so to cope for those who were gender fluid they then had a picture of a woman above the word male and then a picture of a man above the word female so i guess you were supposed to take your choice but the interesting thing is most people still went to the one which had female or male as the first designated stop but then i came across one where someone had obviously decided to get totally out of the debate. One side was marked rats and the other side was marked mice. And I looked at that and I said, what on earth? Do you remember I phoned you about this, Diane? And said, which one should I go to? Because as I, as I watched the people react, it was very evident that most women chose mice and most men chose rats. Even though, as you and I know, the actual designation of rats and mice refers to male rats or female rats, male mice or female mice, which are both sort of one extreme uh, or two extremes of the same general family. The mice being the little ones, the rats being the big hairy ones. So male went to the rats, female went to the mice, the cute little ones, right? But in reality, 
it's a very mixed up world out there. But it also occurred to me because I've been on several archaeological digs myself and in the most recent one, you come across a skeleton. Okay, now, Diane, as a biologist, how would you identify a female skeleton or a male skeleton? Are there enough differences for you to tell just from the skeleton that this is male or female? Well, if you have a whole skeleton, it's easy because you've got the um, di differences in the in the pelvic bones. But even if you don't, there are differences in terms of the uh, if you've got a skull, there are differences in the thickness of the bones um, and the um, orientation of them. So, yes, you can tell. Now, these days, of course, we have extra things like DNA. Uh, which we you can extract from old bones. And, of course, in an archaeological site, you've also got artefacts. Um, and so you then relate it to what we know about the history of the, this particular site. Uh, and that's one of the things that the, uh, the academics who are cr criticising this group, saying that um, you, you, you've got to look at the whole archaeological site. You can't just look at the bones. And we know from the history... Um, that, that certain things were related to men and to women. Uh, okay, so, so, yes, you, you can tell from... But, so, Diane, we, re we recently had a look at a fossil scala, a archaeological scala, I don't know what, it sort of overlaps fossilology and archaeology. Yes. Um, well, you yeah. use the word skulls are thick or bones are thick. Now, many of the feminists would say men are thick, uh, what's the difference in sort of skull thickness for men and women? Is there a real difference there? Uh, it's to do with the, um, the the shape of the jaw and things like that, just like you can tell a female face from a male face uh, because of the, the shape of the face and the shape of the jaw. Uh, so you, they're, they're fairly subtle differences, but they're definitely there. Uh, so you could make up a 10-point list and say, Eight out of ten, it's a male. Six out of yes. ten, it's a female. Mm -hmm. And nine out of ten, it's transgender. Oh uh, well, of... you, you you can never identify them as transgender. All you can say is we don't have enough data, uh, because right. quite often uh, bones in archaeological sites have been fragmented because <laughs> they have suffered from uh, the disturbances and other things in the uh, uh, depending on how long they've been buried. Uh, yeah. So, yeah, there are some times where you just do not have enough data, but then that's no excuse for saying that the, this, these are transgender or non-binary. All it means is that we just don't have enough, um, enough of it to, to get a good picture. Uh, and I think we and, need to be honest about that and just say, well, we don't have enough data. And, and before we hand back to Joseph, thank you very much for Christina about that information from Welsh where the Welsh word for rat means big mouse. And I'm sure they took advantage of that in making some of those movies about mice going to America and all sorts of things like that. So, uh, Joe, uh, are you ready to bring your report now and your big announcement? I am indeed, if you can hear me, because the music has stepped up significantly. We're actually... Yeah, we, uh, you're all still got, good, mate. You're we're all still good. good. We've got double the trouble. We've got the big concert going on over there, and then I've got the kids thing with the rapper going on behind me. So we're completely surrounded by music. Um, but there we go. Uh, some would probably debate whether this even was music. But anyway, I thought what we'd start by doing is showing you a uh, little article which was published in a local newspaper called the Oswestry Advertiser just today. If you have a look on there, it says, have you spotted a T-Rex in town? Here's the reason why. Um, well, the Oswestry Advertiser is the local newspaper and uh, they've picked up on the fact that there's something going on in one of the buildings, one of the new buildings inside Oswestry, or something new is going on in one of the buildings inside Oswestry. And the article is actually a, a short little brief article basically saying a bit about Creation Research UK is moving to Oswestry and they're bringing the dinosaurs with them. Now, what's wonderful is uh, I had to vet the uh, article very briefly on the van on the way down here to Creation Fest. But what I really appreciated about it is they didn't shy away from the fact that we are Christians. They said Creation Research UK. They said we're looking for evidence of creation and the origin of humans and animals and all sorts of stuff. And so, uh, as you can see, 
as you could expect rather, it's caused quite a bit of a stir. Uh, quite a lot of people are very, very keen on the idea. One person have said, this is complete pseudoscience from a religious establishment. There is no mention of dinosaurs in the Bible and completely goes against the grain of evolution. I, for one, won't be stepping anywhere near such a place with my child just so she can end up confused and feel subjected to something that isn't real. So we've upset some people as well, but that's fine. Well, hey, we're still, we're still, controversy. <laughs> we that normally do that. <laughs> We do indeed. So what is this article about? Because yes, this is public knowledge. We had a supporters yeah. meeting the other day. Some of you were invited to it. Some of you couldn't make it and you were sent out the uh, video link for the supporters meeting. But this is our big public announcement on creation research. And uh, it will tell you all about it. Uh, a reminder, we have things in Creation Fest at the moment that we're handing out. Things about our convention the rocks cry out uk fossil convention that's coming up shortly it's going to be a really really exciting time so make sure that you get your tickets in also if i can grab it we're also giving these out and you can order your own one sam's got it as well the creation news global and if you've already got this you would know there's a two-page spread in there all about our uk museums project really exciting stuff so this is our little announcement which is just going to tell you uh, a little bit about the museum project and where we are and where we're going to so let me just get my slides up on full screen and see if i can work out how to do this there we go share screen and we're away all right what you can see on the screen there is a young picture of me and a slightly younger john mckay this was back in 2014, and uh, I knew that I'd been called to ministry. I didn't know how, why, what, or when, but I had been encouraged by a number of people to put my fossil collection on display. In 2012, we'd gone on our first ever convention trip to go and uh, dig up fossils, right? First ever family holiday specifically to dig up fossils. And I ended up putting many of them on display. Over the next two years, we collected more and more, and we ended up with this rather fine collection. Of course, it's grown rather significantly since then. And in 2014, I met John for the first time. I've been following the ministry for a long time. I met John for the first time, and we discussed me coming in and doing some stuff with creation research. This was really the start of it when it all kicked off. Uh, we had a few interesting things in the museum, things like the crocodile skull, which we actually have our own crocodile skull here at Creation Fest, if you can come and see it. And uh, John also got me to do some public speech for the first ever time. I mean, I was very nervous. I was quite stuttery, but uh, I must have passed the test because I'm still here today doing it, right? I think that I've probably got a lot better, but that's not really for me to say. But uh, the Lord has greatly blessed me and my involvement in the ministry, and we've come a long, long way since 2014. This is another thing which John started training me to do and something that we're now starting to train other people. In fact, uh, we uh, are even praying about getting an internship program here in the UK so we can bring some people along and they can help get involved with the museum project. They can help do some work for us and they also get some good training. And this is one of the things we do. We lead field trips. This was my first ever John Mackay field trip experience and I was part leading it, right? So I was thrown right in the deep end, but it was great fun. And we now lead my own field trips for creation research and I would encourage you to come along to one, particularly the Rocks Cry Out convention, where we're going field tripping every single day. We had some rather interesting displays in the museum. I mean, you see the big trilobite, right? The three-lobed thing. You see the fossil teddy bear from the color Vivari, fossilized or permineralized in just a few weeks. Really cool, exciting stuff. And the few shelves that we had when John came grew to a few shelves and a couple of tables and the few shelves and a couple of tables grew and grew until we started inviting people around to come and see and we named this the genesis museum of creation soon to become the genesis museum of creation research uh, because we got involved with creation research more and more and it was in about 2017 that me and john had a good sit down and a proper good discussion about the future of a uk museum and the idea has always been, rather than to have one enormous, massive museum, 
we were going to have a network of museums all kind of founded and funded by one central museum where we could hold the collection, create displays and continually swap them around. So the idea and the idea is still and the idea was to have a central museum with a network of smaller museums supported by local churches so that we could make a dinosaur display and that dinosaur display could go on display in a local church and that would be there for a few months in a mini museum and then we could create a living fossils display and the dinosaur display would move on to the next church and a living fossils display would come and take its place so the idea of a network of museums mini creation discovery centers supported by one big museum has been in the plans for quite a long while and these are some of the central Bible verses to the museum ministry. Psalm 111. The works of the Lord are great, says the psalmist, studied by all who have pleasure in them. You understand that the work of the Lord is not just the miracles that Jesus did. It's not just the salvation that he gives to us. It's all of creation. It's all the work of the Lord. In fact, the Lord there is a name. It's not just any God, it's the Lord God, and the Bible is completely explicit. It is Jesus Christ who is the creator. We know which Lord we're talking about. Great are the works of Jesus Christ, the creator, and they are studied by all who have pleasure in them. So we want to study his work, the work of creation. And we want to present this work so that people may see and know, may consider and understand together that the hand of the Lord has done this, the Holy One of Israel has created it, just as Isaiah said. Yeah, we're putting this on display so that you may know, so that, that uh, Richard Dawkins can see, so that Dave Attenborough may consider and understand altogether that it's the Lord Jesus Christ who has actually done this. The Holy One of Israel has created it. And then finally, Psalmist says in Psalm 148, praise from the Lord, praise the Lord from the earth, you great dragons. Now, I tell you what, outside here we have two life-size dinosaurs we have some great casts and models of dinosaurs and we are asked more than any other question well why are dinosaurs not mentioned in the bible i mean we've had it today just here five or six times it was one of the things that our guy commented on in that news press why you know are dinosaurs not mentioned in the bible surely it must just be pseudoscience nonsense well I'm afraid the psalmist would take issue with that. You have to understand that the man who invented the name dinosaur simply considered dinosaur as the technical scientific word, right? Uh, what did he call dinosaurs? Sir Richard Owen invented the name dinosaur. What did he call dinosaurs before and after he invented the name? Dragons. And the bones he was digging up were purely considered to be the bones of old dragons, whether they were sea dragons or land dragons. Yeah, Bible does talk about dinosaurs, but in the... It talks about dinosaurs when it talks about dragons. But you know what? Even if there wasn't a mention of any dragons in the Bible, it would still tell us that God created them. Because in six days, the Lord God made the heavens and the earth, the seas, and all that is in them. All that was, all that is. That includes the dinosaurs. So we do this research, we study, we put on display, and we praise the Lord. And we make sure that our dinosaurs are praising and glorifying the Lord as well in what we present. So where have we been for the last few years? Where are we going and how can you support us no matter where in the world you're actually watching this? Well, this is what we started at in 2019. This is where we were up to at the point of the pandemic and uh, having to close down. We had the Genesis Museum of Creation Research. We have some snazzy logos. We've got new logos from Sam now. But this is how that building over in Norfolk had progressed. We actually custom built displays around the building, around the room. We were absolutely jam-packed full and we had shed upon shed floor to ceiling full of fossils and john mckay has been collecting fossils here for 30 odd years right and uh, we had a church in manchester floor to ceiling in fossils and we had some fossils up in scotland and we had some fossils down in london we had fossils all over the place we needed to get them into one place and we needed to start really working on the museum project of course the pandemic hit shortly afterwards but hey the lord had a plan as always including this for many years i worked as a zoo animal keeper 
Uh, you can see some of the animals down there. Yeah, we are planning once again to bring some reptiles and invertebrates to the forefront. It'll be great to have some critters out there and talk about, well, why would God give creatures very sharp teeth in a very good world? How can they be good? That was a question we had earlier. What about venom? How does venom fit into a very good world? In fact, we had one gentleman earlier who was convinced that the only good part of God's creation was the Garden of Eden. He believed that everything outside of the Garden of Eden had to be horrible and vicious because, well, there couldn't have possibly been any T-Rexes in the Garden of Eden because they've got horrible, vicious teeth. They must have been in the bad part of the world outside the Garden of Eden. Well, we had to take him through scripture. We had a big, long discussion with him, and we taught him the answer as to why things like venom and sharp teeth and stuff like that exist. But hey, that's a topic for a few weeks' time, and uh, you can find out plenty more information about on our website. But we're going to have some great animals in our museum project as well. And for the last few years, we've uh, been housed up in this building, a wonderful building, the Quinta Sunday School. This is where we've been housed for a while at the blessing of the church. Um, but it came to the point where it was time to move on. Uh, we weren't able to stay in there for a long period of time. And so we thought we need to have a good place somewhere where we can go and fully establish this building and have the freedom to stay here for a long while, have the freedom to do any building work and repairs that we need to do, have the freedom to get you guys involved with a museum project and actually get this on display. But you can see how our building museum, uh, our museum collection rather, has grown. It has grown magnificently. We've collated all the fossils from around the UK and all their different holding areas into one and the Lord has blessed us beyond and above anything that we'd even dreamed of, or certainly I was dreaming of, just a few years ago. Fabulous fossils, fabulous artifacts, fabulous historical stuff, Great evidence, fossil jellyfish, uh, fossil fish buried quickly, giant dinosaurs, huge mosasaur jaws, and giant life-size dinosaurs as well. Absolutely great fun, and all makes that very important point that we keep pushing people to, that it's Jesus Christ who is the creator of all. And so we founded the Creation Research Center, where dragons praise the Lord a place to be able to put all this on display to facilitate research to facilitate training and interns and to really get that message out there and this is the building which we've ended up at oh the artwork is all concept artwork it's all got old cambrian fireplaces right because it was an old cambrian you know it was an old uh, fireplace showroom but um the concept art looks pretty good and yes praise the lord when pray and support us because we want to get all of this concept art real art in reality right big signs and dinosaurs and all sorts of stuff and that's really what the article was about because we were moving some dinosaurs in we've already started doing one or two things but we have a big move coming and yes you can come and help us but there's what the building looks like without all the concept art it's an old showroom it's in Oswestry, which is in Shropshire in the United Kingdom. It's pretty central. It's about an hour and a bit to Manchester. It's about an hour and a bit to Birmingham. It's about three hours only to London and about three and a half to four hours into Scotland and up to Glasgow. So it's pretty well connected around the world. Uh, sorry, around the UK. So it's a pretty central location. It's a pretty big building. It looks pretty spectacular. Inside, it needs some work. So continue to support and donate and help and more comments about that in the future but it is laid down out as a sort of fireplace uh, showroom so we can knock all this down we can do what we want we can decorate and set up and all sorts of cool stuff cinema area there hey here's a funny one right back in 1939 not long after this building was put together uh, there was a clause put on the building to say that there were no moving pictures to be shown in the building that was still in place in 2022 right moving pictures cinema right well we had to make sure that that was completely removed so we could have some moving pictures in there right televisions and cinemas and whatever we want really it's got a two stories upstairs and downstairs there's the upstairs it's already laid out pretty nicely it's got private areas out the back and a full set of offices and there we are with a couple of the dinosaurs moved in uh, it looks pretty good even the plants uh, seem to fit in we've had some comments about that and yes, it was these dinosaurs here that we had the photograph taken with our business solicitor who helped us and uh, ended up in the local newspaper. So exciting stuff. This is well and truly public now. And it's a fantastic building which allows us to facilitate 
all of this research, all of these displays, all of the creation of these displays and distribution of them as well, as well as research facility, as well as conferences and so on and so forth. The Lord has really abundantly blessed us. Now, here's a little, uh, I don't actually know if this is going to work. Uh, we'll I'll give it a what, Joe, why do we, We've already got this uploaded on, um, on Restream, so we can just show it there. You play it now then, Sam. You go ahead and play it. This is a short little video of me just giving you a brief little look around the building. It's only a couple of minutes long. Brief little look around the building and uh, gives you a bit of a picture of the potential of this place. So, Sam, play ahead. Well, hello, hello. This is to give you a little bit of a tour of the new building and a bit of an idea of the potential of this place. So we're in Oswald Street. The main town is just behind me. We're tucked a little bit out of the way, but we're still pretty much in the centre. And have a look at what we've got just round here. So. We have our wonderful T-Rex skull ready to go inside and then this is the building. It's nice and secure, it's got everything that we could possibly want. So come inside, have a little look around. Of course we have another one of our dinosaurs, but this opens up into this very, very large area. Now this used to be a fireplace showroom, but it's, uh, you know, we can construct and deconstruct and basically do whatever we want in here. So we can redo all the lighting and pull out all of these fake walls and organise it however we want. We're thinking of a sort of a cinema area in here where Creation Research can show some of its documentaries like Fire and Ice and so on and so forth, a place to introduce the museum. As you come around here, in the back there, there's a little uh, courtyard which we're going to turn into a tropical paradise with animals and plants and all sorts of wonderful stuff. We've got private offices in the back there and toilets and everything else um, in, the, in the back room over there as well as a meeting hall. But it doesn't just stop down here. If you follow around with me here, we can go upstairs because this is a two-story building. Wonderful great big staircase. And then finally upstairs, lots of more natural light. And you can see it's still all set up as a fireplace, uh, you know, showroom, but still we're all going to have, be able to have lectures up here, we're going to be able to have meetings, we're going to be able to have a museum set out, we're going to be able to really do whatever we want. So it's a pretty big building, it's got masses of potential, it's got a lot of brand new appliances and everything else already set up. So this should give you just a little bit of a sneak peek as to you know what we've got here and the potential that this building has but very soon you'll be able to come actually see it for yourself because we will be doing an open day here so watch out for more details I'm assuming I'm back on now, Sam, with you my uh, PowerPoints back up. Great stuff. So there you go. Be encouraged about that. Uh, there's a lot of work that needs doing, but it's exciting times. You can see the full creation research team on the uh, screen there, and we're adding to the team as well. Um, so continue to keep us in prayer, uh, all the people around the world who are working towards this. Yes, in the UK at the moment, we have over 25,000 followers and artifacts the collections aren't just fossils they include natural history geology archaeology we've got some of those things on display behind me a quick rundown of a few of our choice selections because like you say 25,000 we could be here all night we've mentioned things like the hezekiah seal in our archaeology program go and get the full story there but a wonderful reference to a biblical king beautiful fossils and fossil fish swallowing fishes and we've got some of these things that oh sorry not swallowing regurgitating fishes but that's a brilliant evidence of rapid burial uh we've got big mosasaur bones and oh, it's just absolutely beautiful exquisite preservation from some of these fossils giant sea lilies or crinoids giant dinosaurs great new things like stalactites and stalagmites they don't take a long time to form in the slightest wonderful dinosaurs that people can get up close and personal with wonderful artifacts like these egyptian mummy masks that help us to correlate egyptian history and chronology and are really useful in this kind of work and it's not just the uh you know, physical things, it's the reenactment as well, bringing the Bible to life. This was at a recent event uh, in Norfolk at the Good News Stand where we were sharing the gospel to people and I was dressed in full Roman gear. Yes, we've been blessed with reenactment stuff. Yes, it's fun, but also it brings the Bible to life. The time of Jesus, the armor of God, all the above. So 
We even made the newspaper. It wasn't the first time we've made the newspaper. We've made it quite a lot recently. So pray that our witness in the newspaper uh, actually gets out there. Notice what I'm standing in front strategically. Mm-hmm. I made sure when the press photographer came around that I was standing in front of the Bible verse. Um, They've cut some of it off, but nonetheless, most of it's still there, right? Uh, Because we wanted to make sure we really do spread the gospel. Beautiful brick. We've actually got that here with us here today uh, with the mention of Nebuchadnezzar, that great Babylonian king from the British Museum, nonetheless. Long story behind this uh, and a real good biblical point. So go and watch our archaeology program. There's the actual trans the the inscription the transliteration and there's the translation from the british museum references nebuchadnezzar in the first person which is very significant all right where are we going from here and how can you support us no matter where you are around the planet because it's important to remember that whether you're in australia whether you're in new zealand whether you're in the states or the canada or in the uk creation research is one great big family organization headed up by john mckay uh, and uh, individual people like me working tirelessly in our individual country so no matter where you donate no matter where you uh, send your money whether it's to the usa creation research to australian creation research to uk creation research it will all go towards supporting this ministry here in the uk so we have three big things going ahead number one is the big move number two is the museum and fossil shop setup and number three is the big open day Here's some dates for your diary. Yes, for the next few days, we're down here in Creation Fest. Busy, busy, busy times. So make sure you're coming down and see us if you can. And watch out for some of those live videos where we take a walk through the museum that we have set up here and uh, share some encouraging stories. From Thursday uh, the 11th until Tuesday the 16th of August, we have the big move. We need volunteers. Thank you for everybody who's got in touch so far. Uh, We'll be getting in touch with all of you people and organizing stuff. But if you want to come volunteer, shift some wonderful fossils and artifacts from one building to the next, volunteer on Thursday the 11th to Tuesday the 16th. Get in touch with Creation Research in the UK. That's info at creationresearchuk.com. All the details are on the website. Uh, We have our big convention in September to October. The rocks cry out. Make sure you get your bookings in. We're getting full, which is really exciting. And finally, if you are, or rather before finally, if you're in the UK and uh, you have a church or want Creation Research to come to your church, make sure you get in touch because we're doing a big ministry trip Possibly with Diane, we don't know yet, but uh, Lord willing, we'll be able to do a big ministry trip in October and uh, so on. And then finally, on Saturday, the 29th of October, we will have our museum open day. There are details on the website on our events tab at the creationresearchcenter.com, and uh, it's a ticketed only event, so make sure that you book in advance. But more details will come about the open day very shortly. Remember the Rocks Cry Out Convention. Remember the Creation Research Open Day on the 29th of October. Come and see the collections. Come and see the museum partially set up. But if you want to come and donate, if you want to come and support, if you're a skilled laborer or you have uh, trade knowledge, like builder, carpenter, electrician, anything like that, we would greatly appreciate any help if you're in the UK. Come and support us. Uh, Even just cleaning and sweeping would do a fantastic job. Yes, we need your support with the big move. We need your support with actually continuing to hire this place and doing the maintenance and the renovation. Yes, we need your support to be able to get all this stuff on display and prepare the exhibits so that we can take them around the country and around the world. And yes, we need bookings for the UK ministry. We're relaunching that after COVID properly this time. So get in touch if you want Creation Research to come to your church and display that evidence and give our sermon. So there we go. Big, exciting uh, announcement. There's a few websites to finish on. Check them out. We're um, relaunching, revamping, whatever you want to call it, some of our websites, but a lot of information is already up there and uh, it'll go live with all the full press details and uh, stuff very, very shortly. Sam, if you just put me up to full screen again while I remind everybody to go and uh, get, because once these are gone, these are gone, right? Go and uh, grab your 
global creation news newsletter. We don't normally have these as uh, print in the UK. They're only printed in Australia, but for the first time, we've printed them out, and so you can order your own free copy. Of course, we uh, we are very grateful for any donations to cover postage costs, but they are free on the website. You can buy a bulk one for your church, and it's got the two-page spread there all about the Museum UK ministry. So go and grab that now. But thank you very much, and be encouraged be excited great stuff hey awesome well, thank you joe that was great and uh, i think because of my absence of uh, next generation help i'll save my powerpoints on jurassic arc that it'll be just as relevant next week i'll, I'll have uh, someone to get me straighted out with this so is that all right with you joe Sounds good, yeah. We need to get uh, a young grandson of yours back into gear, I think. <laughs> well, he'll, he'll be back on duty next week, so that's Amen. great. Um, Amen. We've been sort of looking at some of the questions going on on the stream beside us. Some great stuff there. But, uh, Sam, you've got a list of questions that sort of come up over the last four or five weeks. We're all with anticipation waiting to see what your, uh, you've got a list there. So let's start with some of those. We most certainly can. Uh, but before we do, of course, we have to thank all of our lovely people who have donated so far. Mm -hmm. And of course, in traditional uh, Croatian Conversations fashion, Doki Doki coming in swinging with the three US buckaroos, pair character stretching his arm forward, raising a thumbs up. There we go. And a super sticker from Jim P199 Aussie buckaroos, a red pop box of popcorn. <laughs> lovely jubbly. And we also had a, uh, a super chat from Keith for 10 US buckaroos. Thank you so much, everyone, for that. Right. OK, let me pull up the questions that we've had previously uh, that I've collated. Uh, so here we go. Here's the first question. Uh, what do you know about tiny halos in Coldfield Wood, which pose a problem for secular geological time? OK, I'll uh, start off here and joke and hand over. What you're talking about is so-called polonium radio halos, um, which you actually do see in, in coal. You see in other places as well. You can collect specimens of igneous rocks. That's where I went looking for them first. And basically the, the radioactive emissions have damaged the surrounding crystal, leaving a sort of a, um, a, di a, a, a small diameter spot that you can see with your naked eyes is much more visible with a, a hand lens or whatever but the size of the circle represents the actual strength of the um the radiation coming off it which means you can actually identify the sort of material that's giving rise to it and the the commonest one that does this has is what's created the problem and that's polonium which is a very uh, interesting short life one but it seems to in many of the rocks have no antecedent and that sort of set up the problem you would have to have this giving off its radiation in the time the rock was forming right there's no sort of uranium list that goes all the way down like uh, sister states do in in many radioactive chains uh so that's that's where it's set up joe do you want to comment on on that from there i think you've covered most of it the music has got very suddenly very very loud here um, so I think uh, if we just move on for a minute and I'll jump in and, and, and participate when the music's dropped down slightly. <laughs> okay, well, I'll make one more comment on yeah. that. And that is if you find these radio halos, the common claim has been that's the evidence of a created or a rapidly formed rock. Uh, now, logically, that makes sense. There's been a few criticisms that have been raised over the years, but the basic argument is a... Uh, a good one and should be pursued for those of you who want to pursue radioactive stuff to a deeper level than uh, than what's actually been available. Uh, that's probably the limit of my knowledge. I've followed the debate from the outside as someone who sort of dabbled in uranium lead uh, isotope geology. Uh, and by the way, since they mentioned coal at the start here, coal, petrified wood, all of these have uranium particles in them, surprisingly and they all create radioactive damage but not, none as visible as the polonium halos but the most surprising thing for me to find was that many coal deposits actually have tiny particles of uranium in them in fact if you knew how much uranium was in coal deposits you wouldn't even consider burning it but so far it hasn't created 
huge amounts of uh, health issues or anything, <coughs> anything like that. Okay, and next question, Sam? Certainly can. Right, next question coming up. Do we have to be theologians to understand Genesis? <laughs> Diane, what do you reckon? <laughs> uh, in, in a one word answer, no. <laughs> um, the Bible was written for ordinary people. Uh, and that, that applies from Genesis through to, to Revelation. Now, that doesn't mean it's instantly understandable. You do have to study it. The, the, the Bible itself says that. But in terms of Genesis, it's one of the plainest uh, pieces of, of Scripture there is. It's just a plain narrative. Anyone can understand it if they have um, reasonable understanding of any sort of literature in the in the language that it's been translated into. So, no, you don't have to be a theologian. You just have to be someone who is able to read and understand uh, English if you're reading an English Bible, another language if you're reading another Bible. Uh, but it's a clear, straightforward narrative meant to be understand, understood by everyone. In fact, I, I think of the world's best Bible teacher who never went to Bible college at all, and yet he appeared on the public stage at age 30, and one of the books he quoted from several times is the book of Genesis. Of course, it's interesting that his highly trained theological college graduates, the Pharisees and the Sadducees, attacked mm. him because, hey, you're just a carpenter, right? You don't yeah. have any theological training. How can you understand the word of God? And, of course, Jesus would, in his arguments on divorce and remarriage and all of those things, quote straight out of Genesis, haven't you read back in the beginning God made them, made them male and female? Now, the very uh, evidence that he used these quotes is an illustration that an untrained, untheological, uneducated, year five uh, carpenter trained by his dad didn't go to uh, bible college or anything was sufficiently trained enough in reading genesis to make a point that the highly trained theologians had missed right they were hiding what was in the bible by their education and jesus was exposing them by his childlike trust notice i didn't say childish i said childlike trust in what god had said in genesis and he would say, haven't you read back in the beginning, God made them male and female and away it went. Therefore, gay pride football is wrong. Oh, sorry. That's a political issue. Isn't it? But that's where Jesus would have gone. Therefore, he said, uh, God does not believe in divorce. In the beginning, it was not so. That was his whole context. Therefore, homosexuality, lesbianism, all of the things that are taught there for, uh, right through the Bible begin with that simple approach to reading Genesis. Now, um, one of the things that I've discovered time and time again, in fact, I was recently reminded of by a pastor who got up to introduce me at a meeting and basically said it was John Mackay's teaching and Ken Ham's teaching, which basically kept me sane going through Bible college because most of the academics at Bible college wanted to give you 10 views of Genesis and then leave it up to you to decide. Instead of being Bible teachers, they became Bible non-teachers. They just confuse the issue with the academic theological qualifications. So caution. Can I encourage you like Jesus? Know your Bible and use it because you've studied it in God's presence. You've studied it for his glory. Don't go and get 10 PhDs and just confuse the whole issue. Anybody else got any comments on that? I'm just jumping quickly. Just a quick reminder to everybody that the academic standard of a degree based authority or prestige doesn't always quite work out because both john and myself are far more qualified to talk about evolution and millions of years than charles darwin ever was and by the same coin charles darwin is far more qualified on talking about the theology side of things than me and john are that's if you go by the standard, oh, well, if you get a degree, you're an expert in academia side of things, right? Because Charles Darwin never graduated in geology or in biology. He graduated in theology and uh, he messed it up big time. Me and John, we've both graduated in geology, right, and fossils and all sorts of stuff. And one of the big things that we do with creation research is actually go out there and dig it. We don't just sit around and think about it, right? Um, but you'll, I think you'll find, well, I won't boast on my own name, but I'll boast on John's name. He's one of the best Bible teachers that I've come across, right? Uh, because at the end of the day, we're Christians. 
we love the Lord and we study God's word. So don't think that you have to hide behind the knowledge of some sort in order to be able to understand the Bible. Um, you just have to be open and willing to uh, to to take it to take it in and to as uh, you know as Jesus said, He sent us a helper, and that's a helper for understanding the Bible as well. Awesome. Right. Okay. Next question coming in hot. Uh, why are the humans the only creatures that blush? <laughs> Diane, this is your question. <laughs> uh, there, there has actually been some research into this, probably because we, um, our skin can actually be seen. Um, uh, whereas mo most uh, other creatures, uh, particularly other mammals, of course, are covered in fur. So even if there's uh, skin colour changed, you wouldn't see it. Um, as to why it's related to the things we do blush about, um, that that's uh, probably there's probably more psychology in that um, because uh, certain things will make one person blush and another person not. So there's something uh, go going on in the mind there. Um, but the, the actual process of blushing is just uh, where the blood vessels open and so that you see that the skin goes red because of the increased blood flow. Um, and uh, in, other, <clears throat> in other creatures, uh, particularly furry mammals, um, that wouldn't be seen, um, whereas it, it seems to be, um, whereas we can see it in people because we're not covered in hair. Um, as to why, well, uh, that that's more of a <laughs> more of a philosophical question as to why we have this function. Um, but but yes, it's a, an interesting biological um, ph phenomena that does seem to be related just to humans. And it's certainly true that if I meet a big, brawly, absolutely suntanned Aussie, it's very hard to determine if he's blushing or is he just sunburned. Um, because the brownness in his skin hides the reaction Diane's talking about. So it makes a lot of sense to say if your face is covered with hair, I can't tell if you're blushing or not. So it's not an issue when it comes to monkeys, apes, gorillas, orangutans or chimpanzees. But uh, Joseph with his fair pommy skin, Diane with his her very fair skin would actually show the blushing effect, even if we don't know why it happens. But we do know it usually uh, sort of emotes a period where we find either embarrassment or delight uh, or a reaction um, in some way, shape or form that's above and beyond normal. Craig, you got any embarrassing blushes to tell us about? No, no, I don't. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm not an embarrassed I have many animal related ones, but I don't think they'd be appropriate to talk about right now. <laughs> No, I don't think so. I know that no. story. That was very embarrassing. But, Sam, anything else? Yes, we've got questions for days, guys. Questions for days. Uh, right. How did they find out about many million year things, to, about how many million years things took to evolve? Was it entirely guesswork? Okay, I'll go in first. If you look at Charles Way and Charles Darwin, you know for sure because they existed before any of the radioactive dating elements were in use, right? Even though people had sort of begun to uh, think about the age of things, the, the dates that are used uh, in terms of how long to evolve simply assume evolution to be true like Darwin and Lyell did. Then they come along and say, if we take snails, how long does it take a snail to evolve? And if you have 12 layers of snails, which you do under Paris, you put an estimated date of uh, millions of years on this, then you turn around and reverse it, and you say, therefore, it took three million years, five million years for a snail to evolve into a different species. Now, none of that is objective science at all. It assumes the bottom layer got there first. It assumes the snails lived and died and then turned into the next species. Your invention of a species for the new snail is totally arbitrary because you don't know if they live side by side whether the layers form one on top of the other, or as we say at Creation Research in our experiments, and go and have a look at our strata programs, the sediments move in from the side. So the bottom one is not the oldest. They're oldest on the right side, youngest on the left. 
So the order of events, the whole thing that Darwin and the others used is absolutely false. It's fake, but it's so well written in the literature, so well publicized, so popular, most people take it for granted that it happens to be true. Joe, you're the other geological brain here. What do you uh, put into that one? Well, like John said, the entire concept of uh, your evolution stemmed from that original belief in millions of years because it was Charles Lyell who influenced Darwin. What Charles Lyell did is get the world to accept that the Earth could be very old. So Charles Darwin just walked into the door and said, well, given enough time, you know, molecules can evolve into microbes, which can evolve into man. Right? There's no real sort of evidence for it. And as John said, a lot of this time, it just, things are just literally um, plucked out of thin air, thinking about that trip to the, the ordination and the snails, right? So uh, we've got to understand where did this idea of millions of years come from in the first place? We've dealt about that creation conversations before, so go and check out for the full uh, story. We talk about the tracing it back through deep time, right? That's one of the um, topics that we're going to be talking about at the Rocks Crowd Convention, by the way. But what you'll find is that Charles Lyell didn't invent it. He borrowed it from Charles Hutton, who was a fellow Scotsman. Uh, James Hutton, rather, uh, he didn't invent it. He took it from the French revolutionaries who were trying to get rid of the monarchy and they needed a way to get rid of God. They did that by borrowing the idea of millions of years and really a sort of pre-uniformitarianism thinking uh, from the Greeks. And the Greeks borrowed it from the Hindus and the Babylonians. And you can trace it all the way back to an initial rejection of God or initial rejection of truth. And every time that history, it crops up, it crops up because people are trying to get rid of a concept of God. They're trying to get rid of a concept of the supernatural. And the argument is, given enough time, anything can happen right? Things can just evolve. And so really they play off of each other, right? If the earth is very old and it's old enough, then things can happen by themselves and things can evolve. And in fact, if we make the evolution needing the millions of years, then you're a win-win, right? You have no need for a God anymore. So you've got to understand the anti-God, the anti-biblical uh, philosophy, which underpins the whole of the millions of years. It underpins the whole of the idea of evolution. And it's this idea of trying to get rid of God um, first and foremost. Yep, I don't think there's anything else we can add to that. <laughs> you are smashing these questions out, guys. Awesome. Uh, right, another question. How to respond to the phrase, even if evolution were true, it doesn't mean creation is true. Um, okay, so what's the op other option? Um, you know, you, 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 you've sort of, uh, you can throw things out there like that, I guess, but not present an alternative. Um, it, there's there's got to be some form of creation or design or intelligence or something that happens without any intelligence and uh i just I, I i think evolution is the best attempt to uh to try and explain things without design or intelligence um and it and it, it doesn't do a very good job of it in my view if you have <clears throat> well there is a grain of truth in that in that uh, knocking holes in somebody else's theory doesn't make yours right and that's why at creation research, yes, we do expose the fallacies of evolution because it is used as an excuse not to believe the Bible because anyone who has read the plain meaning of Genesis and has seen uh, a TV program or read a basic um, high school textbook about evolution knows that those two things are not the same so that the um, the theistic evolutionists are barking up the wrong tree. That's a whole other issue. Uh, but uh, so people are using the theory of evolution not to uh, to as an excuse not to believe the scriptures. Whereas our um, we we make it quite clear here that we are presenting the uh, real history of the real world as told in the Bible because we want people to know the Creator, and the Creator is Jesus Christ, who is also our Judge and Savior. So that that is a good point. Um, simply knocking holes in somebody else's theory does not make yours right. But you then have to ask the question that Craig uh, uh, brought up. Well, if if this is wrong, what is right? Uh, and so that's where you have to step in. Otherwise, people will go off and try and look at um, mysticism and various other uh, other things 
uh, which are equally useless for them in terms of their own, uh, their eternal destiny. So we make no bones about it. We are in here in this work to show people that if you look at the real world, it fits with what we are told about the history of the real world as set out in Genesis and in the rest of the Bible as well, because we want people to know the creator. We don't just want them to know about creation as a, as a theological or scientific concept. Um, but I'm sure all of the others can uh, add to that. Yeah, I was preaching well, to an Aboriginal, Aboriginal church last week, and the pastor wanted me to deal with made in the image of God, okay? And I said, why do you want me to deal with that? He said, because in their culture, they know about a God. They may not know his real name. They certainly don't know a savior. And he said, they have no concept of being made in the image of anybody. Uh, so if I was to remove their cultural background, all their myths and legends, and not replace it with the truth, I would destroy that person. I mean, we've known for ages, if you change a person's history, you have to give them a new history or you destroy their future. So keep that point in mind. Secondly, give you my history. When I first began to uh, read the scriptures, when I first began to do geology at university, we had a professor who said, I'll just say God did it. The trouble was I was doing way more than geology. I knew a lot about fossils and I was going on to study biology and all those sort of things. And what I'd become aware of was that you could say that if you like, but it ended up being completely illogical. Why say God did it when your whole evidence for evolution, the textbook, which I've quoted here before, we used in zoology, Professor Carter, vertebrate habitat and structure in evolution, was emphatic that what I learned in geology was also true, that what I learned from Charles Darwin and his chapter on geology was, was the real situation. There are no fossils that back up evolution. So you have a Christian professor who just say, God did it, use millions of years of evolution. Did what? There is no evidence for evolution. What sort of a God have you got? And, and I, I gradually became aware that I could not believe evolution, not because of theological reason, but simply Darwin was right. The fossils are the worst part of his theory. Professor Carter from Cambridge University said, once the fossils appear, they remain inherently stable. Now, that stumbled me for a while until I realized that demolishing evolution is not the same as proving creation. So the first creationists really were really anti-evolutionists, the evolution protest movement. Bless their efforts, but it, they only went so far and they stopped. Disproving evolution is no help to anyone if you don't replace it with something positive because the Bible itself says test everything. Only keep the things that are true. It's written in Thessalonians. Uh, <coughs> Paul also wrote, watch out for false science. It leads you astray. So the concept that says, believe God used evolution and there's no evidence for evolution. You've just been led astray to a liar God. And there is only one liar God and his name is Satan. And he's out to trick you about everything, evolution included. So what positive tests? Well, 10 times in Genesis chapter 1, it struck me God said he made things to produce their own kind. If that was true, once creatures appeared, it didn't matter how old you thought the world was, because I didn't know how old it was. Millions of years was just as acceptable to me then. It wouldn't matter if the first seal account was 100, 200, 300 million years old. If it's never turned into anything except a seal account, then it's produced its own kind. Positive, tick, evidence. But then that turned out to be true for every group. In fact, by the time I'd finished genetics, the one thing it was very evident to me, A, our professor was adamant. He didn't know how evolution happened. He couldn't find a single mechanism. In fact, the mechanisms within the cell seemed designed to prevent anything evolving. They were self-mending or the thing fell off the, the, the life loop and you called it extinct. So the whole of creation was providing positive proof that A, creatures were designed to produce their own kind, B, they were designed to stop evolving. So there not only was evidence against evolution, there was positive evidence for creation. So while the statement is theoretically correct, can I suggest 
If you stay there, you will be absolutely unsatisfied philosophically, scientifically. Yes, the statement is true, but it's useless. You've got to go on and say, what evidence can I give these Aborigines? They were made in the image of a God who speaks. Ah, number one, they speak, you speak, God speaks, monkeys don't. Right, and so you can start giving positive evidence. Uh, you made a boomerang. It didn't happen by itself. We create because God creates and we were made as his reflection. So we had a wonderful night sharing the actual positive evidence that we were made in God's image, which, by the way, the Bible says God will demand of you why you did not respond to him. Right. There's only one time you could say, I can't see any evidence. And that is when the Bible says God has turned you over to foolishness. Romans chapter one, you've seen the evidence, you understand it, you know it, you've rejected it. At that point, God will turn you over to foolishness. So you think homosexuality is sensible. Any homosexual? No, it's a plea for the homosexuals to wake up, actually see what the evidence is and repent of your foolishness. So no matter where you, <coughs> you go with this, there is evidence there which demands your recognition. Joe or Craig, any comments to add to that? That's pretty detailed, John. Well, the only thing I was going to say is that the music has become so loud that my volume is <laughs> on full on my laptop and I can barely hear any of the answers that the rest of the team are giving. So uh, oh. I regret it, but I think that I'm going to have to sign off um, because it's just getting a bit uh, a bit ridiculous at the moment. In terms, We can of hear you, Joe, very clearly. Yeah, you're, 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 you're actually, actually, clear. you're actually so, coming in quite clear. I think it's probably because I've got a very decent microphone, but <laughs> the well, noise is good. pretty. That's good enough for us. Okay, that's fine. Well, I might hang around a little longer then and see how how much I yeah. can uh, how much I can hear. Do you but, have some uh, headphones you could use. I do have somewhere, but in all of the sorting out and everything, I've uh, I've mm. misplaced them. So um, now you guys carry on. I'll hang around and try and catch what I can. But the uh, <laughs> the noise is quite booming, shall we say? <laughs> Right, right okay. Sam, next one. Uh, here we go. Does apparent age explain much of why secular scientists believe the Earth to be millions of years old? Uh, apparent age. Um, now, if you were to look at me, some people would say I was old. But if Methuselah was in the room, you'd have to make a serious choice. Now, Perhaps I've aged more rapidly than Methuselah. Remember Methuselah, the Bible character, who says lived to be 969 years? Now, I've never met a 969-year-old person. Did he age more slowly than me? Uh, when did he have his last child? Was it at 300 or 400? I certainly won't be having children at 300 or 400. So when you look at me, then there's something that's coming into operation that we rarely think about. Now... Where I came across this first was when I stumbled across a genetic disease which speeds up your aging. And Diane can comment on that in a moment. But you can look at someone who's maybe 15 or 16 and they have the body of an 80-year-old man. Now, if you would look at that person, you say they've been here for 80 years. What you really meant was based on my experience of seeing 80-year-old persons, that person looks 80-year-old. But the fact is they're not. So apparent age is never a good guide to anything. I see someone pick up a fossil at Jurassic Ark, and don't forget September the 24th, which will promote a lot next week, we have our annual open day, but they'll pick up a rock and they'll immediately think, hey, this has turned to stone. It's a piece of timber. It must be real old. Hidden behind their thinking is, given long enough, trees turn to stone. So they have a hidden assumption first about age. So warning, warning, before Diane talks about genetic ageing of the diseases, I hope she knows something about it. I just came across it. Um, it. You actually have hidden beliefs in your head about what constitutes age. If we had a alien, you know, from Mars, if there was such a thing, come to planet Earth, how would they decide which of us were old or which of us were young unless they lived here? They might come and say, look, these people get younger and younger. They get smaller and smaller until finally they disappear back inside a woman. Um, they would be totally wrong, even though the evidence they were using could logically make sense that way, that what it missed was experience to distinguish truth from error. Diane, you got any comments on that? 
Uh, well, in terms of the premature aging, it's just a degeneration. It is a genetic problem, so it, it's it's a loss of the um, the normal maintenance uh, processes that we have going on in our body, which is what normal aging is anyway. It's just that it it happens more quickly because the actual maintenance programs uh, are are broken. Um, but but yes, it's uh, apparent age. Um, it is based on a whole lot of assumptions of how long you believe something takes to happen, um, whether it be a rock layer or whether it be a, 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 an animal, or whether it be a person. Um, it, it's, uh, it's an idea that we have in the back of our heads because we have been told, oh, this rock layer is this old because it's so big and has so many layers in it, or this person is so old because they have certain signs in their skin uh, and their hair and uh, and in their body functions as well, which our observations are that it normally takes sort of a certain amount of time to happen, but it's been speeded up because of a genetic disease. Um, are you saying, therefore, Diane, that if we went to the Garden of Eden where there was a tree of life and we could eat of that tree of life, it would stop that aging process actually turning on once we're kicked out of the Garden of Eden Adam begins to age so we can measure the time he's actually on earth as 930 years and perhaps a 930 year old man looks the same as a 93 year old man in our present world and one reason they didn't have kids until they were 100 or 200 was the whole life cycle was stretched because of the good genetics is that the sort of thing you're saying well well that's quite possible um we're, we're not told sort of how the tree of life actually worked but it seems to be the significant difference uh because uh when god judges adam and eve um he specifically says uh they must not be allowed to have access to the tree of life otherwise they could live forever they could so um there was obviously some built-in regenerative function now, if you think about it, um, our normal biological processes, which are chemical processes, do actually can da damage our cells. But if the repair processes can equalize or outdo the degenerative processes, well, then you will live forever. The problem with aging is that the repair process processes are damaged and the, the problem with some diseases are is that the, the uh, surveillance and repair processes uh, are knocked out so that they can no longer work. Uh, so and it is very significant that God says we cannot let them have access to the tree of life. So that was what was um, the, the key to them living forever in their physical bodies. Uh, and it is interesting in the new heavens and the new earth, there will be trees of life there. And we know that we're told that we will have eternal life there. So it must have had some sort of regenerative um, function, not quite sure what. Be interesting to find out in the new heavens and the new earth. But just think, if the repair processes and the regenerative processes can equal the uh, decaying processes, yes, you will stay alive and you will stay as good as you were and of course, with Adam and Eve, everything that God made was very good. So there were no genetic diseases, no degenerative processes in the beginning. So if they still had access to the tree of life, they would have lived forever. And that's specifically stated in Genesis. When we had all the kids at Jurassic Ark from the high school yesterday, we took them to our strata machine and to our uh, stalactite machine. And the whole theme of the day was it's not time, it's process. So if you have the right mm. process, you can get the maximum return for your investment of time. So we can grow stalactites that long in just a few months. They don't take vast amounts of time because we've got the right process. We've got chemicals. We've got the lime and all of the things that normally would dissolve in the water very slowly. We've got the situation where we've added bacteria. We've got the situation where we've got mulch and that to supply the bacteria and they speed up the whole process. Wrong process, wrong amount of time. Right process, very short amount of time. But the ordinary person would come in and say, wow, that stalactite must be hundreds or thousands of years old because in their head, they've got an assumption that long time is involved. 
they haven't even got the concept change the process you increase the you improve the little amount of time that you actually do need so it applies to everything radioactive dating to uh, sunlight damage it applies to human aging and all of that sam next one uh, uh, yeah right okay next question uh here we go was jesus appearing to the disciples or god speaking to moses or abraham uh, or Abraham, did that take away their free will? I'm not quite sure I understand the wording of that uh, question. Sorry, was yeah, I'm not either. I'll, I'll yeah, start I, off. I, I, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Go ahead, uh, just straight, Craig. Oh, okay. Yeah, look, I, I think I get uh, what they're, they're, asking, they're, they're saying mm -hmm. there is that, you know, because God has appeared to them, therefore they've got no choice but to believe. Well, I still think there was plenty of people that saw Jesus and even his miracles and still didn't believe, uh, including the high oh. priests and so on. They um, they they deliberately um, paid people to lie um, about their witness of his resurrection, um, and and so um, they were determined not to believe, um, despite the evidence, I, I guess. So that of course Moses the 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 disciples had, had a lot of great evidence uh, before them. I think we all have if we investigated enough, but um, they, they had incredible evidence that most of us don't have, and, and God had purposes for their lives, and he, he, he knows all things in advance. I guess he, he knew even their responses uh, and what they would be. Um, but I don't think it takes away their free will because the evidence of others around them even um, is such that they 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 didn't choose to follow god yeah that's certainly true like even the mm. men who were healed yes. 10 of them went away and he what mm. one of them came back to say thank you they all had yeah. to choose that but at the same time don't overrate what's called free will we never have totally free will i mean i was born in australia bang goes my will to be an indian right bang goes my will to play cowboys and indians in america other people have made choices for me that I must bear the consequences of some good, some not so good. And as we've got an awful lot of chat today on uh, free will and predestination, all of that, I'll give you a couple of clues. Uh, otherwise, we'll get totally sidetracked on, on this issue. And it's so easy to get sidetracked. Don't put God inside a Calvinist box. He doesn't fit. And don't think you can stuff him inside an Armenian box. You'll find he's too big for either of those boxes. At the same time, don't make your will bigger than a Calvinist box. So you think you can make choices about everything. You, you can't. You didn't decide what school you went to. You probably don't decide what country you want to live in. Most of us never make a decision about when we're going to die, right? So you'll find that there are many things you have to humble yourselves and say, it's beyond my ability to actually choose. I can't do that. I was born in Australia, but only because my dad seemingly chose to come to Australia to mine things but seemingly chose, well, I discovered some of the things that went on behind. I'd say his choice was forced. It wasn't a choice that he would have made, perhaps. Uh, and you find our free will is not so free as we like to choose. I mean, Paul is the extreme example. He was going on the road to Damascus to kill Christians, mm -hmm. and voila, there's Jesus appearing to him, and we don't read of him for another three years when he's one of the best Bible teachers on the planet, having been taught not at a place where he was chosen to go, but a place where Jesus will interacted with his. And when I became a Christian, one of the most humbling things, and every one of you who wants to be a Christian, warning, warning, if you're not a Christian yet, you have to build into the fact that the Lord taught his disciples to pray this, our Father, which art in heaven, yes, old King James Version, uh, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done. Do you realize even if you don't think of any predestination before you're a Christian, the one thing you want when you become a Christian is for God to go ahead and choose your way. I don't know what word you want to use for it, but I'm happy to have a God who knows everything and knows what's right and knows what's wrong, determine which way he wants me to go for his will to be done. Because there is another choice. And for all of the chat that's been on the background, don't forget one thing. When you become a Christian, he did the work. He saved you, but he left you with responsibility 
and he's warned you Christians out there, warning, 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 I can't emphasize enough, you will be judged on what you choose to do with your responsibility when you become a Christian. Uh, there's two judgments, uh, both for the Christian and the non-Christian. For the non-Christian, your judgment about sin, you will find that if you are not saved, then the judgment Christ took at Calvary does not apply to you and you will spend eternity being judged for that. Uh, it's, it's a choice that you've made. At the same time, Adolf Hitler in hell has a worse judgment. Saddam Hussein has a worse judgment than ordinary Billy Bloggs for the things that he did, killing people, massacring thousands, right, using chemical gas, etc. His judgment will be far worse. Judgments for salvation, judgment for works. You Christians, Jesus has taken your judgment. Now, you can argue about how much free will you had in doing that, but in reality, it was his choice to come to this planet and take your judgment. So give him praise. But nevertheless, he holds you responsible for what you choose to do when he says, go into the world and preach the gospel. And you say, but I'm comfortable. I've got a good job. Now, you'll be judged for making wrong choices on this planet. Don't run away from it. Joe, can you hear us now? Obviously just not. about. It's still no, just about. It's still going loud. I'm hoping they finish at like half past or something because we've moved on to some. Uh, uh, we have a wide variety of songs. It has to be said. But there we go. Um, I'm <laughs> back on track, I should think. So uh, carry on with the questions and I'll try and interact. I'm waiting. I'm waiting for the first court case when a set of parents or individuals sue a church for hearing damage. Mm. I'm sure there'll be an interesting one when it comes, but there we go. I mean, we're like, I don't know, quite far away. <laughs> and it's still pretty bad. But there we go. Never mind. It's not my kind of uh, it's not my kind of music, but there we are. Carry on, Sam. Right, okay. Uh, we will start to move on to the questions we've had this evening. Uh, so from George Bond. He says, uh, what did the koalas eat if they were in the middle of the Middle East? There's no eucalyptus trees there. Well, I could probably respond a little bit to that. Um, they don't even eat all eucalyptus trees, to be quite honest. Uh, there's nearly 600 species of eucalypts, and koalas only really eat a fraction of them. Um, they'll eat grey gums, for example, mana gums, um, and, and various other gums. But in my work in forestry I came across koalas a number of times and and we've seen them up in other trees eating other leaves for example um she oaks which which are fairly widespread across um uh, various areas uh, up into the pacific um north pacific there above us um they also eat paper barks and other trees and i think it's a little bit like we spoke about last week with plants is that um, it's it, we, we spoke about how the plants that are most adaptable are the ones that survive in, in the long term, and I think that's the same with animals. The ones that are most adaptable are the ones that end up surviving in, in an environment. So it's not to say that koalas can't eat other things. It's just that they're in now in an environment that's dominated by eucalypts and they've got a, a digestive system that enables them to, to handle it. It's a, it's a slow breakdown um, of the eucalypt leaves, which have got a lot of toxins um, that, that stop a lot of other things eating them. But there's a number of, of animals that can handle it, including uh, very unique Australian animals such as the greater glider and, and yellow belly gliders and things like that um, will also eat eucalypt leaves, but they will eat other things. So I suspect when they were moving out, um, I, I presume the question's inferring from the time of Noah's Ark landing on Ararat and the, the koalas have then dis dispersed, is that they, they were adaptable enough enough to eat other plants in the meantime until they came to um, the, the Australian environment where they, they could handle eucalypts where many other things couldn't. Okay, I'll add a bit to that. Mm. Um, Craig, you might want to comment a bit later, but I personally observed kangaroos eating eucalyptus leaves, and I was shocked by that. I, you know, my schooling said only koalas can eat this, but like you, I've, <coughs> a few other creatures can. What they do with it, I don't know, but they certainly can. But the whole question, George, has an assumption that the Middle East of today 
is the Middle East of yesterday since Noah's flood is the Middle East before Noah's flood. Now, the fact is, in Genesis, you find there were water was in one place up till Noah's flood. So the land was in the other place. There was no Middle East. Sorry for those of you who are Israelis. There was no Israel before Noah's flood. And <coughs> then when you have a look at the world today and you say, well, Moses was promised the people could go to a land flowing of milk and honey. Well, the Israelis had to work really hard to remake that prophecy about the desert uh, flowing with milk and honey again by them rebuilding the water supplies and all of that. They're working hard on that and the desert will bloom with a rose and they've been really working hard and, and are playing an active part in that sort of prophetic future. But you'll find when the, the history of the world is immediately after Noah's flood, the Israel and that develop as the, the continent shift around, as they mess up, as they rise up, etc. There was no Middle East until after Noah's flood. Secondly, you'll find the distribution of plants now is not what it's traditionally been immediately after Noah's flood. Come with me to New Zealand and you will see living gum trees only because uh, our Governor Gray decided it was time to ship koalas. No, he didn't ship koalas. He did ship possums, which are now a menace in New Zealand and they're protected over here. You can shoot them at will over in New Zealand because Governor Gray took the food from here to there that they could actually eat. But surprise, surprise, come with me and you'll find fossil gum trees in the sediments in New Zealand. So they've been there. They probably died out due to the really extreme cold that covered New Zealand, but not Australia. And now they're back because we took them back. Likewise, if you go to Israel or California, you could freely take koalas to California now because we shipped the whole heap of gum trees over there actually to provide a matchstick industry. It's backfired because the eucalyptus now gives off lots of eucalyptus oil. And so the huge fires are not due to climate change. They're due to us sending matchwood across to California that gives off absolutely flammable oil. And in the heat of the day, you will find the whole sky gets on fire because it's an explosive gas. It makes our sky in the, in the blue mountains. It gives it that really blue misty look. And that's eucalyptus oil that you'll find that they grow just as well in California as they do grow in Israel today. So you can reestablish them. You could probably ship koalas in the end, even though in the meantime, due to cold, due to heat, due to man's ravaging of the environment, the eucalyptus and that may have disappeared. Diane, any comments? Yes, yes. The uh, reason that koalas can uh, eat eucalyptus leaves is because, as Craig said, their digestive system enables them to do that. Um, and uh, p part of that is also having the right sort of microbiome. In other words, the microbes that live in our digestive system and, and in, in the digestive systems of all animals. And that gets passed on from one generation to the next, actually. Um, and so... Uh, what once they've established um, that they can eat eucalyptus leaves, that just gets passed on and reinforced from generation to generation. So, um, so it's partly biology, and also, uh, as John said, we know that uh, eucalyptus trees can grow in other parts of the world. So, who knows what was actually growing in what we now call the Middle East? Uh, in the immediate post-flood times, uh, but since then, of course, the world. The climate has changed, the world has dried out, and uh, a, a lot of vegetation that was probably once more widespread is now um, more uh, fragmented. Uh, so the animals that uh, depended on that vegetation, um, they also became limited in their range as well. So interesting mix of biology and, and geology there. And some so, of the edibility yeah. of some of the foods might have changed over time as well. Yes. Craig, have you ever yeah, seen so it might have been more history? edible, in, you know, yeah. right after the flood. It'd be interesting, for example, to test whether uh, koalas would eat things like olive leaves, you know, the, the first yeah. plant to identify yeah, yes. after the flood. Yeah. Craig, yeah, yes, it's seen... a case of um, what, what was available. Um, yeah. And uh, what once they... Um, well, once they have a microbiome that sort of suits a, 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 and a digestive system um, that, that suits a particular food, that, that does tend to get passed on from generation because the, the, 
baby koalas actually eat uh, partially digested material fr from the mother's um, uh, uh, mm. digestive system as well. So that establishes their microbiome. Uh, mm. Craig, have you ever seen like I have kangaroos eating eucalyptus leaves? No, I can't can't say I've seen that, John. No, but it wouldn't no, surprise no, yeah. me. I'm still You're waiting hungry for enough to, eat, don't you? to verify that, so I don't boast much about it. But it was interesting, particularly in the knowledge that the koalas uh, actually deliberately mm. feed their babies, um, you know, eucalyptus poop or pap, uh, and they make sure that the babies actually get a biome, a gut biome that could actually digest. Uh, the really harsh sort of food that eucalyptus actually is. Sam? Yeah, well, just to show time. the adaptive... Oh, sorry, okay. Yep. That's fine. Right, okay. Uh, thank you for that, George. Uh, right, okay, here we go. This comes in from our good friend, Ravi. Uh, can't Christians in good faith disagree about the interpretation of Genesis without calling God a liar? Okay, nobody's brave enough, so I'll start the uh, toss going here. Um, having come from outside the church uh, and having become a Christian through reading the Bible, I'll encourage you to do the same. I didn't know I was doing it, but obviously uh, did do it um, because there was many things in the Bible reading from Genesis. Remember, I didn't have theological training. I didn't grow up going to Sunday school every Sunday. We had a generic Christian society which believed in something called truth, even though I wasn't a Christian and didn't sort of go to church on any regular basis, you know, weddings, funerals or that sort of stuff. But in reality, I always found it very helpful to actually have a to be decided box in my brain. So I'd read some things uh, in Genesis, X, Leviticus, Numbers, whatever, through Leviticus. Uh, and, and, and decide, well, I haven't got a clue what that's actually about. So I'll put it aside until I have enough knowledge to reach a decision. You will find that point number one, if you learn to do that, it will save you a lot of arguments and save you a bit of embarrassment when you think somebody else is telling a lie. In reality, they know a lot more than you do about the subject. I found this is true in Genesis as well as in the theory of evolution because I've had many professors when i've been doing debates they would in essence call me a liar this used to worry me because i thought okay, now i'm a christian that's the one thing i try to avoid uh telling lies so am i have i got it that far wrong and then i discovered i actually just knew a lot more about the subject because it had been my pet subject my favorite the stuff i dug up all around the, the globe and my professor the guy i was debating he was a specialist in microbiology of uh, you know butterfly genetics or something like that he knew absolutely nothing so therefore he assumed that what he'd been told about evolution generically was true therefore what john mckay would would say can't be true by definition so if you humble yourselves and have a box out there called i'll decide this in the future when i've got enough information it will save you a lot of these sort of arguments so can't christians in good faith disagree about the interpretation well, the answer is yes, but don't assume, therefore, your non-interpretation is true or your alternative interpretation is true. Be a little bit more humble about it. Uh, but remember, in the end, you're going to be held accountable by God for what you say. The thing that shocked me most, were, well, two, two sections in the Bible that sort of brought my attention rapidly to a stop was that every word that comes out of your mouth will be recorded. Uh-oh. Once I found that, I thought perhaps I'd better have a few few less words come out of my mouth because if they're going to be recorded and half of them are wrong or ignorant, then I'd better phrase them a whole lot better. And secondly, there's a verse in the Bible for those of you maybe in education that says teachers will be judged twice. Yep, it's in there. Go go hunt up teachers, go hunt up leaders, go hunt up. You'll, you'll be judged twice. Once for the mistakes you make yourself, and the other for mistakes you teach others to make, right? So teachers beware. God holds your theories, your words, your interpretations very, very seriously. Can you disagree about the interpretation of Genesis without calling God a liar? Usually we're calling each other liars. Um, but here's the caution. You see, if you say something and it turns out to be wrong, 
the enemies of God or the ignorant of God will in the end blame God. They won't blame you. You'll be forgotten totally. They'll say, well, God's word lies. What you've got to get across the fact is God's word never lies. He never tells a falsehood at all. It may be me who's wrong, maybe somebody else. It may be you who's wrong. So you can disagree, but have that. I will discover this. I will source this out in the future when I know a lot more. So when I first found out God says things produce their own kind, you sort of think, now, how would I know that's true? The answer is test everything. What do I know about pussycats? They turn into pussycats. Okay, I've spent 20 years looking at pussycats and dogs and chickens, and not once have they done anything but produce their own kind. So when I get someone tell me the Bible allows you to believe in evolution, I can say, sorry, my friend, I would have agreed with you once, but I've discovered the evidence does not support it. You are wrong. I'm not calling you a liar. I'm just calling you wrong. But God's word is true from the beginning and 10 times. It says he made them produce their own kind. And don't be surprised he's done that because the Bible says God never changes. And he stamped his nature upon creation. So koalas will always turn into koalas. But since they live in a sin-cursed world, don't be surprised they can die out. They can disappear off the system. Anybody else want to throw in something on that one? Well, I just thought, John, as you were speaking, that if God did something or says in his word that he did uh, creation in a certain way, but it's not true, then he is a liar. Um, yep. So, and of course, I don't believe God's a liar, but you're you're calling him a liar. So the, the, the classic part of this debate is whether God created the world in six days. And it says in Exodus even that for in six days, the Lord God made the heavens and the earth. Um, so if you want to say he did it in 13.4 billion years, well, you're calling him in his word a liar uh, because it's very clear what the scriptures say about, you know, the, the length of time and, and how he created the earth. So so like you said, you've, you've got to be very careful in, in calling God a liar in his word and coming up with some other theory thought up by men. Yep, good point, Craig. And lots of our debates are about that professors who say well the word day can mean many many things etc and you have to pull their argument apart trying to do it as politely as you can but in the end what they're saying is god is a liar right and that is one thing that neither you nor i can actually allow to be said god is not a liar he's the one who came to this earth the god who is man jesus christ and his basic statement was i am the way i am the truth so good point craig diane or joe any comments well, from my own experience, actually, as to why I got uh, involved in, in this uh, in this work, um, I was uh, uh, interested because I could see the difference between what the uh, what I was learning in science in, in school and university, and what I was reading in the Bible. And I was often fobbed off by vague statements about things are spiritually true, um, or I remember asking a particular teacher actually about uh, Adam and Eve and uh, and he said oh that just means God created man and God created woman whereas I could see that God actually said more than that um, but this whole excuse of all oh, things are spiritually true um, but not necessarily scientifically true and in the back of my mind I had this problem well if if God says things that are spiritually true why wouldn't he speak the truth about what I called the real world uh, meaning the the physical world that I was learning to study at school and university. And I had become a Christian by then, and I um, accepted that God's word was the truth. Uh, there have to be answers to this. Why is there this mismatch? And, of course, the mismatch was only in my mind out of my ignorance, and so I went looking for answers, and there weren't many in, back in, in those days because there was very little written about it which is why I eventually wanted to go into helping with the creation research type uh, work. So that because I was able to find out that, in fact, the real world fitted with when you looked at the actual evidence, fitted with what the Bible said. 
And that was just such a huge boost to my faith that I could believe the rest of what God said about spiritual things and about um, moral things and about behavior and all of those things, because all of God's word was true. Uh, so uh, as John said, you, you do have to have a sort of yet to be decided box, but don't don't leave it completely in the dark to um, uh, if you don't understand something, and this applies to science as, as to anything else, um, if you don't understand something, just because we don't have all the answers doesn't mean there aren't any. Go out and search. And if you do that in good faith, God will open up uh, opportunities for you, which is what he did for me, and he certainly will do it for you. If, if you go out in faith and say, all right, I don't understand this, there seems to be a mismatch here, I need to do some more research. And in fact, that's what we're trying to do with creation research uh, as well as help people find answers to apparent mismatches. And I think a lot of people have been blessed around the world, Diane, by your analy analytical insights into some of these questions in, in various forums. It's uh, It's been wonderful. I know I have been anyway. And what Diane finished on as well, that's what we're doing at Creation Fest. We're putting this stuff on display for people so that we can engage with people and we can deal with them with those challenges that they get. We've had so many people who are challenged and question these issues. So mm. by getting that stuff on display, that really fits in nicely with what Diane and you know, that's really what creation research is about. Awesome source. Yes. Right, okay. Uh, oh, sorry, Diane, did you want to carry on? No, no, I was just thanking the other two for their affirmations. <laughs> Uh, right, okay, here we go. Uh, here's one from Doki Doki. Can you respond to the argument that well-known and respected Christians have believed in evolution, so it's okay for other Christians to do the same? Okay, let me sneak in a commercial here. Uh, Sam, if you'll put up the website, and again for Q&A, because myself, Diane, and the others have dealt with this issue over many, many years, We've run debates, so if you want to stream a debate with Dr. John Polkinghorne, who would have been England's leading theistic evolutionist, who would have lived his life saying it's okay to believe in evolution and it's okay to be a Christian who believes in evolution and led many people down that garden path since the Bible says Jesus is the creator of all things and he made the world in six days and you, you can actually watch the streaming you can watch you can buy that the buy a stream you can go and you can go to our q a diane can you think of some of the questions we put on there on that q a or the fact file about this yes we specifically have a question about um uh human evolution because uh that that's a, a, an idea that has been promoted by uh even conservative evangelical christians that somehow um uh, God stamped his image on the evolving hominids. Um, that, that question is there uh, if, if you look up uh, on the Ask site, on the Ask John Mackay site. Uh, it's also in our book, uh, Questions and Answers, our um, question and answer book. Uh, I don't know if anyone's got one to hand. Uh, unfortunately, I don't have one that's within uh, quick reach. Um where, where we where we deal with that whole issue and there are quite a few questions there's a whole section in that book uh did god use evolution so yes we have uh, several questions on the ask site in that book and also if you look in the fact file we do often make comments uh, relating to why theistic evolution just doesn't work uh, now, going back to the actual question, respected Christians do believe in evolution, um, and I, I'm not saying that they're not Christians. Uh, we're not saying that they're not Christians, um, but uh, we all come into the faith with uh, with various ideas. I've had to unlearn a lot of things since I became a Christian, so other people have to do that as well. It's part of our normal experience. We are saved by grace. Uh, but after that, God does expect us to grow and we have to learn. Um, but ultimately, it does come down to sometimes we have to make a very hard choice. Whose word do I believe? And it may be someone that uh, you respect enormously. 
uh, on a whole range of other issues. But remember, ultimately, you do have to make a choice. Do you believe the words of people or do you believe the words of God? And if God says something that is completely diametrically opposed to something, no matter how respected a person uh, you may know uh, says, uh, ultimately, you do have to choose God's word. Um, I'll yeah, always be and, grateful and, and, to, the, to the reformers who, who came up mm. and said the Bible is our standard. God's word mm. is our standard of faith, our standard of morals, our standard of behavior, right? In other words, Christianity is not a democratically elected set of truths. Christianity is a revelation, mm. and we all must be subject to that standard. That's our, our where we go to. So it does not depend on what 75% of all respected Christians believe the following. Irrelevant. It doesn't matter if it's 99%, right? In fact, sometimes 100% almost of Christians, you would say they believe this, to which your answer should be, show it to me in God's word. Show it to me where the Bible says this. Only after that can you say, oh, yeah, that's what I'll believe, not because of you, uh, but because of the faith that Christ has given me in his word. So when you have a look at the Reformation, be grateful to those guys who took us away from Catholic medieval superstition that was really inherited from the Greeks. And for quite a few of the reformers, it took them quite a while to escape that loop. It was so mm. logical to believe this or the sun was the, you know, it was going around the earth and all those things that had been made doctrine that simply were the majority belief. And watch out for evolution. It may be the majority belief, but it's the one thing that's not taught in the Bible. And it's as plain as the nose on your face. So open your eyes, see what God's word says, get rid of the concept, the majority say. Yeah, a lot of, um, I think one of the important things of this, this question is what does evolution say about the creator God? When you, when you nail it down, um, it's really saying, as a lot of even, even atheists realise, it makes creator God, um, uh, uh, you know, basically uh, an evil God because he's created using so much distress and pain and disease and suffering over billions of years before mankind ever sinned. So you can't blame mankind for it. You have to blame the creator. And in Colossians it says to us that everything was made by him and for him and uh and when we understand who jesus is so uh you know he he's a perfect god and he makes things perfectly deuteronomy 32 4 says that all god's ways are just and that all his works are perfect and so we don't want to be calling god a lot be calling him cruel or mean or anything like that he's a good god the bible says over and over he's a good god He's a God of love. He's a God of justice. He's a God of perfection. And uh, the creation was made uh, good by a good God uh, for him, not not necessarily for us. It was really for, he made for God's glory. Creation is for God's glory. And um, if it's a faulty, mutated, disease-ridden creation, then it says a lot about the creator because that passage in, in, in um, Colossians really goes into... Um, how how the creator jesus christ reflects god everything about him and um we know that he's he's created a good world that's been corrupted by sin of mankind i got a sort of semi-sad semi-funny story to finish this section off unless joseph wants to add something and that is simply that i was in a a church background public school right so they had had a a church affiliation but they were now essentially totally state funded totally state government they taught the state curriculum etc and i was invited to be a speaker to the year 12 13s and uh, they sent one of the school um what do they call them almost like someone on the board of education for the local area mm -hmm. uh, they sent them along to listen to what i said and just check john mckay the aussie guy the australian to check him out so I gave my lecture and uh, asked the students for questions. And afterwards, one of the, the persons who'd been sent along to check me out said, oh, we firmly believe uh, that God created in this school. And I said, well, what do you actually believe he created? Oh, he used millions of years of evolution. And I, I thought that would be the answer. 
and then i said well which god are you talking about he said what do you mean i said well which god are you saying use millions of years of evolution is well you know the, the, the god of the church the, the, the we believe in god i said well i'm sorry but you don't believe in the god of the bible because he said he made the world in six days says so here right now in reality he was shocked because he was using the word god as just a general throwaway line thinking he could escape the next evident bit that his god was a liar because the god of the bible tells the truth now joe do you want to say anything to close that question off all i was going to say is that at the end of the day it really doesn't matter what well-known and respected christian authors think <laughs> there's no sort of beating around the bush with it right now it's certainly true well-known and respected christian authors speakers even theologians can be very helpful uh they can help you think about things they can help teach things we are uh you know we are told to 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 to, to listen to listen to preachers to be involved in a church and so on and so forth but ultimately um you need to go back to scripture because the reality is no matter how well respected and how well known you are christians are fallible sinners uh, and as a result of that we do tend to mess things up quite often so it's uh, well worth to say you go back to to my pastor in the church which i really started to mature as a great christian one of the things that he would always say and it was nice sort of you know verse by verse teaching through the bible he would always say don't just take my word for the preaching. Make sure you're checking what I'm saying with what it says in Scripture, because Scripture comes above my word. Now, I'd say that. I'm sure John would say that as well. And it's uh, really important to make sure that you're actually looking and seeing what God actually says in Scripture. Because like we dealt with earlier, you don't need to be a theologian or well-known and respected Christian in order to actually understand what Genesis is saying. Well, I saw there's a, a comment there about Hugh Ross. Uh, who's a you know reasons to believe long ages and and so on i've met Hugh. he's a lovely guy he's a um a really nice person i just think he's wrong um with his interpretation of scripture and that that's a very big subject and one that i think we've uh decided we might uh cover uh, further down the track mm, on a program yeah, uh, i think that'd be good okay last question then sam because time's running very close right indeed okay so i think we can actually merge two questions into one here so i'll put up the first part of the question here uh, ravi says if adam and eve were initially sinless where did the first desire to sin come from how could it not be god and then leads into the second part of the question what does a person need to do to secure their place in heaven okay i'll start this off um when you have a look at the fact that we were made in god's image what god is like we are like but less than god an image is a reflection you stand in front of the mirror your image is like you but it's not three dimensions you're three dimensions you can open your mouth and sound comes forth your image only opens your mouth and someone has to lip read so your image is like you but it's less than you so does god have a will can god write can he speak? Obviously, he said, let there be light. So we know he can speak. So we can speak. But we have to yell out, someone turn that light switch on. We can't just make light with our speech. We are like God, but we're less than God. God created so we can create an electricity system that will generate light. We just can't shout out, let there be light, and the light appears. So we're like God, but we're less than God. What about will? Does he have a will? Over and over through the scripture, you can see God chooses to abandon Israel. God chooses to bless Israel. He's, he's got, obviously, the freedom, the ability, the, the actual strength to make his choices actually work. And when you say, our Father which art in heaven, thy will be done, you're acknowledging that you want his will to be a, a replacement for your will. Okay, now why would you even teach a, a, a person to do that? Because this is Christ's prayer for the disciples. You see, you and I have come a long way from being made in God's image to where we are when we get saved. Here is the first step. Adam and Eve sin. Now the question is, where did sin come from? You see, God gave Adam a choice. He could serve God. He could obey him. And he was told to not eat of the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Now, Adam couldn't choose to make the tree of the knowledge and Adam couldn't choose the consequences. We were made in God's image. We could choose, but
but we couldn't choose the consequences that are beyond our ability to choose. So if we said, I'm going to eat, but I'm not going to die, sorry, the choice was not yours. So please don't stretch your concept of free will to I'm free to do anything. You are not, right? You're not free to breathe nitrogen totally. You're not free to decide that you're not going to die if you become a sinner. So Adam certainly had enough ability to choose between eating and not eating. And by the way, don't think Eve made the choice. She was tricked. In fact, that's so important because later on, Paul says something totally unpopular. I don't let women preach in authority over men because Eve was deceived. But Adam chose. He knew what he's doing. He was told by God what the rules were. And yet he still made a choice, which God told him what the consequences would be. Then sin comes in. The wages of sin is actually death. Adam is now one step down the line, right? He could want to choose, but in reality, there's many things that he can no longer choose. He can't choose to live forever, right? So his free will is now less free than you ever thought it would be. He cannot choose to get himself back to the state of living forever. So you'll find later on, God chooses to come to this planet and to die in our place. He chooses to take sin upon him. Adam could take sin upon himself and die. Wouldn't do him any good. Wouldn't do anybody else any good. So Adam can't choose the rules. Now, I say that it's so important you understand that you may have will, but your will is nowhere near as good as Adam's will would have been. And since then, things have gone down further a long, long way. I'm pretty sure many people in the Ukraine would not be choosing war if they could choices out of their hands. Big guys at the top make those choice. You pay the price way down the list. By the time you get to Jesus, Jesus comes and he dies on a cross for you. And then you are told if you become a Christian, go into the world and preach the gospel. And if people don't take any notice, shake the dust on your feet and go somewhere else. If they make a choice, they may pay a price, but you have to make a choice in response. It's no longer, hey, I'm going to bring eternal life to everyone. You don't have that choice. So in a lot of discussion that's going on behind the scenes, the hidden assumption is that free will can choose anything. Sorry, it hasn't been able to do that since Adam actually lost his, uh, his eternal life. And you can only mm -hmm. choose eternal life through Christ making that choice for you. So limit your discussion on free will to what will can actually achieve. Now, someone else can take the second part. Joe, if people are complaining, they can hear the music in the background. I know you can't do anything about it, but I think you've got a good answer to this one, and it's an important one as we finish off the program. Pretty much, yeah. So the music has finally finished, which is great, uh, at 11 o'clock at night. It's finished um, for the most important part, which is It's good. finished for the most important part, which is wonderful. So, uh, yeah, apologies. I said when watching the chat, we've had no control over the music. We're currently set up as a display at Creation Fest, which is a big uh, Christian musical and teaching festival. Um, and so uh, we they had a big party over there with lots of very, very loud music, which we can't do anything about. But they seem to have finished for the night finally but anyway yeah what does a person need to do to secure their place into heaven um there's a a, a very simple way of uh, of of sort of getting the gospel message over it's um uh, repent of sins submit to god right and then you see this all the way through you see the point is it's jesus christ who is also the creator who actually came down as the savior and as John has just covered very, very clearly, right, we cannot take upon the punishment of anybody's sins other than ourselves. And our punishment for sins results in death. And, uh, you know, that doesn't save us. You see an example of this as well with Moses. See, Moses was there. He was uh, upset because the children of Israel had actually started worshipping a cow, uh, not even a living cow, right, a golden cow and a golden baby cow at that. And so he went to God and he said, God, don't punish the children of Israel, punish me in their behalf. The problem was Moses was already a sinner. Right? He had already gone and killed a man. He had already got angry when God had told him not to get angry. And so the result is he was a sinner and he could take nobody's punishment except for his own. And the punishment, the wages of sin is death. So God had said, I'm sorry, but I can't actually accept your offer because um, you're already a sinner. Nobody else can take the punishment. You can't take on anybody else's punishment. So if you need salvation, what you need is somebody who is completely sinless, who comes and dies. Because if he's not dying for his own sin, then he must be dying for somebody else's. So don't be surprised that it's Jesus Christ, the creator, who actually came to save his creation. Right? We are made in the image of God. Um, 
after all. So you'll find the thing that you do, Christ has already paid, he's paid the sacrifice for your sins, we've dealt a lot with this tonight, a lot about sin, a lot about death, a lot about, I mean, these big technical words like predestination and so on and so forth, but the th important thing to remember is that it's Jesus Christ who's already paid, he was slain before the foundations of the earth, scripture has said, Jesus Christ coming and sacrificing was always plan A, it wasn't God going, oh no, man's messed up now, what am I going to do, Jesus Christ created human beings knowing full well that he was going to come and die and suffer the basically the worst death uh, you know, available to a man in order to be able to take the punishment for the sins of the world. Your offer? Submit, believe, and forever receive. Submit, admit you are a sinner, believe in Jesus Christ, repent from your sins, and submit to Christ, and you're saved. John, any comments? Yeah, I'll make one last one, because I see a continuation of a discussion on the chat there about where does the desire to sin come from. Please don't run away from the fact that when you sin, you chose to sin. So the scripture says, when lust has conceived, it brings forth sin. When sin has conceived, it brings forth death. So take the first sinner, Adam. He sinned when he was sinless. He cannot blame anybody for that sin. He was not tempted by Satan. Satan beguiled Eve. He brings him an Adam with a bite out. At that point, Adam has a choice to make. He can choose the God who made the woman and he'll actually watch his wife die because he cannot bring her back to life. Or he can choose the woman made by God. That's the choice, right? The choice is right there in front of him. He knows if he chooses the woman made by God and eats of the fruit, he knows what the penalty will be. The wages of sin is death. You can say he's tempted by his wife, but Adam can't blame Eve for tempting him at all because he had without sin, he was a sinless person, he could have said, sorry, I choose Jesus Christ above all, his creator. Now, in case you think that's a pretty tough choice, you will find that Jesus gave the disciples the same choice. You'll find that Jesus actually said to Adam, uh, said to his disciples, if you choose your mother or your father or your wife more than me, you cannot be my disciple. Tough love, guys and girls, but that's the choice you made. So please don't say the desire for sin came from outside. It was actually a choice that a sinless man was faced with making, and he chose the woman instead of choosing God. Uh, he could have got on his knees and says, Lord Jesus, she's blowing it. I need another one, right? He could have made that choice. He didn't. He chose to join the woman, and they both ended up paying the price of sin. But Adam is always brought blame for bringing sin in. The desire didn't come from anywhere else except within him to disobey God, right? So don't run away from it. We can't say, I was tempted because of such and such. No, you made the choice. You are responsible. You need to repent. Um, I don't think that's probably a good place to actually finish because it puts it right back fair and square on all our watchers' shoulders and doesn't run away and try to blame my alcoholism on a, a genetic fault or my drug addiction on my parents or my homosexuality on the dog. And remember to keep an eye out tomorrow because we'll be bringing you several live videos from Creation Fest. Pray that my voice holds out because we're uh, uh, not as high on volunteers as we had hoped uh, to be, but we're very grateful for those who have been able to come and help us. Uh, but it does mean that I'm stationed in one place and I'm talking nonstop every day, and you can probably start to hear it in my voice. So pray for strength and uh, endurance. Pray that uh, we will be able to reach many people at this program, Christians and the non. And also remember to go around and order your creation research at Global Evidence News because that uh, is available now and we do have a limited amount available. So goodbye, guys. God bless. We will catch you very so shortly. And uh, I yeah. can't think what our yeah. topic is for next week, but I'm sure it will be interesting. So. <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>